All right, welcome attendees. Welcome in SHSS community to our third installment of the College and Career Series this week. Um, while we're waiting for some uh, other attendees to join us, please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, we've had a lot of people from all over the world joining us this week, and it's been really awesome. Um, we have some international partners with us today um, from all the way across the world from Australia. Um, Kate and Emily, where exactly are you guys in Australia? So we're both in Melbourne here in Victoria. So um, I am actually in this little suburb called Brunswick East. Kate, what about you? Um, I'm in a suburb called Frankston down by the beach. Um, but yeah, both in Melbourne, which honestly the best place to be in Australia, not gonna lie. <laughs> I do agree. I lived in New South Wales for almost five years. Oh, did you? Um, yeah, I've been to uh, Brisbane, Queensland a lot. It's the best over here. Then you would know. Yeah, 100%. I think the coffee makes it worth it, right? The coffee. People complain about the weather, but I love the weather. Like, I am from Minnesota. You can probably hear with my accent. <laughs> We're not from here, <laughs> which is my excuse. If I do anything wrong in this country, I just say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not from here. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm used to a bit of weather, you know? So I like the weather in Melbourne. Yeah, I agree. I think the U.S. gets so much colder than here. So like when people are complaining about it being cold, I'm like, cold? Where? I don't know. And, and they're like snow jackets when they're like walking <laughs> on the, their dogs. You would be used to that. Because I remember the first, when I first moved here, it was like, yeah, it was September. So it was cold here. And I went to the beach and I didn't have shoes on. And I just got the oddest looks. And I was like, we're, we're at the beach, you know? But like they were wearing full like winter gear. <laughs> Uh, we've got a lot of different places represented, all U.S. so far. Um, we've got Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina. I know that's where you were from, Kate, initially from the U.S. Yes, nice to see you. <laughs> uh, Wilmington representing. Nice. Yes. Well, thank you all for joining us. We've got all over the U.S., even Alaska. Very nice, which is cold <laughs> that we were just talking about. Awesome. Yeah, well, go ahead, go Kate. Ahead. No, I was just gonna be like, yeah, they're like wimps. It's not even like none of you experience cold like Alaska. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> we have yeah. someone from Wisconsin. It does get pretty cold there. That's I know. True. It's quite cold. I hope they're not a Packers fan. That's my that's my only ask. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. People out already, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> no, we I welcome everyone here. <laughs> Sweet. Well, we're going to get started here. Um, we've got a good amount of attendees. So um, I'll introduce you guys to these wonderful guests who you've already gotten to know a little bit here. Um, Emily Walter is the regional manager for North America at Monash University. Um, she, sorry, I lost my place here in my script. <laughs> She's a regional manager for North America at Monash, which is in the beautiful city of Melbourne, Australia, which is a uh, the city that they were discussing earlier. Emily is American herself and will be chatting about what it's like to study in Australia. And as a bonus, she's brought along a current student at Monash University, Kate, who's also here with us. So you can get the real gist of what it's like to study in the land down under. Kate is a dual degree student in nursing and midwifery. Um, she's actually in her final year. So Kate is gonna be graduating at the end of 2021, which is awesome. So she's here to talk to you guys about Monash and what it's like to study in Australia. So without further ado, I'll toss it over to you, Emily and Kate, to tell us about uh, that faraway land, Australia. Yay, thank you so much, Grace. So yes, as Grace said, hello, everybody. My name is Emily. Someone just said Alaska's not actually that cold. It's an exaggeration. So good to know. Um, yeah, so my name is Emily. I have the lucky job of trying to encourage American and Canadian students to come over and study in this beautiful country of ours. So I've been here for about almost six years now, actually. And I came as a study abroad student when I was at university or in college, as I guess we would say at home. Um, and I just fell in love with the place here. And now I get the job of trying to encourage more students to come here. So it's definitely something I love doing. And yeah, we have Kate here with us. Kate, do you want to just give a quick intro since you're here anyway. Tell us who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. 
Yes, so my name is Kate. I am from um, originally from North Carolina, but move over, moved overseas with my parents. And then when I was looking at university, I was like, let's just stay overseas. So came to Australia and started doing, yeah, the dual degree. It's gone really well. Highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, that's sort of who I am. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Kate. So today I'm just going to run through a presentation. So I'm mo mostly talking about kind of some differences between what you might find in North America versus what you might find here in Australia for universities. Of course, we do represent Monash University. Um, so I will be talking a bit about Monash as well. And then we can answer any questions if you want to pop them in the Q&A. Um, I will try to answer some throughout, but we'll probably leave most of the more complex ones at the end of today's presentation. But I think the mo most fun part will be talking to Kate and getting a little bit um, from her about her experience over here as well. So I'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. It shouldn't be too long. But I do like to point out a few things um, as far as because obviously there are so many universities that you can choose from in the US or even closer to you in Canada, for example. So I'd like to point out kind of some reasons of, first of all, why you might think about studying in internationally for your entire degree and why you might think about Australia as well. Because I remember for me, like going to my uh, high school or even when I was in college to the counselors, no one ever really talked about like going overseas to study or going for a whole degree overseas. And I think it's really important. And it's great that everyone's here because obviously you have some kind of interest in going overseas. So I think it's really important that you do a lot of research and really think about where you might like to go and, and the different benefits really of studying um, in an international setting. So the first thing that I point out, I do a little bit of research. I'm a research student at the moment and I love, um, I love to just do a little bit. I like to get the numbers, okay? So here's a little research about students who actually went and learned abroad. So this wasn't just, um, this wasn't just for one semester or two. It, was, it also included students who go overseas for their whole degree. So these are just the different benefits that they reported to have found from going overseas, which I think when you look at it, some of it feels a little bit obvious, but it's pretty cool to see that over 75% felt like their um, curiosity, their flexibility and adaptability and intercultural skills improved. And I think that's super important because a lot of, especially the soft skill degrees, like a business degree, for example, or arts, they expect for you to have some kind of point of difference as you go out and look for a job. So it's really important that that's something that you can talk about as you go and look for a job, whether you're interested in studying abroad or doing your whole degree abroad, it's a really big point of difference for you um, on your resume. And it's great for also your personal development as well. Okay, now a little bit about Australia. So like we said at the beginning, Kate and I are both in Victoria, which you can see um, on the southeast of the country just down here. Looks like a smaller state, but we're in the beautiful city of Melbourne down here. And now you can see most of the universities are on the coastline that mimics or mirrors the population as well. Most of Australia's population is on the coast. So you might think of Australia being one big desert and it's really not true. <laughs> um, living over here, it feels really actually similar to living at home culturally. And as far as the environment, um, I will say it's a more relaxed place to live and it's a little bit slower paced, but at the same time, it feels really similar to home here in Melbourne. So as I said, most of the population is along the coast. It's just too hot and there's not a lot, as you can see in the Northern Territory and South Australia. But we do have a couple universities over in WA, Western Australia as well. So this just gives you a breakdown of the 42 universities that we have in the country. It's actually the third most popular study destination. So it's definitely not just somewhere to travel or somewhere to see kangaroos. It's actually a really good place to study as well. So we have this group of universities that we call a GO8 universities. Um, it's called the Group of Eight, and that's our top research intensive universities in the country. So Monash University is one of those GO8. Now, some people say that's like Ivy League in the US. Now, the comparison is a little bit off because, of course, we have less universities over here, but we are a really highly ranked university worldwide. So globally, we're actually number 55 in the entire world, according to QS. Now, QS is a system that ranks universities just based on a bunch of different factors. 
but we are in the top 1% of universities in the world. So even though that pool that we pull from for the GO8 universities is smaller, that's not to say that these universities' qualities aren't very high, which Monash definitely is. So as a country, we have over 730,000 international students on a normal year who study over here with us. And we have six of the world's top 100 universities, seven of the best student cities in the world. Melbourne is consistently ranked in the top three, which is something that we're super proud of. And both Kate and I absolutely love living here in Melbourne. We are just saying I've, I've lived in different states here in the country, including near Byron Bay, which is a beautiful place to visit, but I absolutely love all the opportunities and the culture here in Melbourne. Now, as far as studying in Australia, so you can, there are a couple differences. So you can do work experience and you can be employed as a student if you do study here in Australia. I know that's different to an international student who's going to the US, for example. So you can work up to 20 hours per week, um, which is really important. But we also have a lot of work placement or what we call work integrated learning. So this means that the faculty is usually setting up um, the workplace experience for you. So whether it's paid or unpaid, that is something that we as a country really, really focus on is getting our students out of the classroom and in the workplace so that they can really put their learnings um, to the test wherever they are planning to work. Australia does have some of the lowest crime rates as well, which is of course extremely important and really good health as well. So when you do study in Australia, you have to get something that we call overseas student health cover. And this is what you use um, for any hospital visits that you need or any doctor visits. And that would mean that your healthcare prices are at a much more subsidized rate. So it's not nearly as expensive as it might be in the US. And it's super multicultural here in the country as well. So 30% of Australians are, were actually born overseas. Now, just to give you a breakdown of some of the different kind of prices. So I think that's the number one thing I hear from students is it's so expensive to study over there. But the good news is the Australian dollar is really weak against the American dollar at the moment. When I was a student here, it was one to one. And I wish I had the money to convert some of that money over because now um, we're at a much lower rate than the US dollar. And the other factor there too, is that an average bachelor degree here at Monash University is only three years long. So you're only paying for three years of tuition. You're saving time by only studying for three years. And how we do that is you don't have to study any general units or classes when you come here, you just pop right into the degree. And that also means that you're getting into the workforce earlier as well. So you're making money potentially in that fourth year, whereas those students who might stay in the US, for example, We'll still be studying and spending money on tuition and potentially not working. So I'd like to always just lay out, and now this, this um, is a little bit old, so it's 2019 to 2020, um, but I'd like to always lay out in a table so that you can kind of compare the rankings versus how long it's going to take and how much money you'll spend on tuition. So that is something to really be conscious of as you look up at prices as well. So we love to just show you, just as a little teaser, some of the most beautiful places and the tourist attractions in the country. And it really is truly a beautiful place to travel, but it's also more than just a travel destination, as I said before. So when you apply to an Australian university, it's a little bit different because you actually apply for the program that you're wanting to study or the course that you're wanting to study and not the whole university. So people will say to me, what are the entry requirements to get into Monash? And it's really not that simple. It can be a little bit more complicated depending on what you wanna study. So each program will have its own requirements and the requirements usually have to do with your ACT or SAT score, as well as what classes you studied in high school. So each program, like I said, will have a slightly different requirement. But of course, if there were any questions about that, we can um, discuss that. And I do have a cheat sheet, which is super helpful to help you apply for an Australian university. But just keep that in mind that as you look internationally, you might actually be looking at what you need to apply for or what you need to um, qualify for as far as the program and not the overall university. Now, a lot of students and some of you who might be here today might actually be interested in only studying for one or two semesters. Now that's what 
we call a study abroad or an exchange experience. And people always go like, I don't know what the difference is, what's study abroad or what's exchange. So an exchange program is where whatever university you decide to go to, that's where they have a partnership with an overseas university, but you're actually still only paying your tuition to your typical university. And then they're working out the deal with that overseas university. So why we call it an exchange is because usually they send a student to us, we send a student to them. So it works out for everybody in that they're just paying the same tuition. We're getting our tuition from our student, they're getting theirs from theirs, but we're just basically swapping students for a semester or two. Now that differs from study abroad, where study abroad, usually depending on your university, you can choose whatever overseas university you would like to go and do a study abroad, either a semester or two with them. Now, this is where you're actually paying that overseas university with their tuition. So that's something that, honestly, if you are one of, one, of, one of the other, you won't know the difference except for who you pay your tuition to. That's simply the only difference. But just keep in mind that there is a huge opportunity with the full degree rather than doing study abroad. But study abroad or exchange is still an awesome way to build your resume and to kind of get a little teaser. Like, let's say you're thinking about doing your master's degree after your undergrad, you can always go overseas and experience that for just a semester and see how you like it. And who knows, it might be your parents' worst fear, but you might end up actually loving it and wanting to move over here like I did. And we're still having conversations about it this day. Okay, so something to think about here. So these are just different variables that you might want to think about. Um, about choosing a university. So different factors that students should be thinking about as you're looking overseas. So the courses that are available for studying. Now this, this slide here, sometimes I run through American counselors um, to show them the different courses available, but I would really consider taking or suggest taking a good look at what kind of courses or majors as you might call them at home are available at any university you, you might be interested in. So Monash University actually has the widest range of program options of any Australian university. So we usually find that there really is something for everyone. And a lot of our students actually take a double degree. And Kate, we're really lucky to have Kate here today because she is a double degree student and can talk about that experience. But this is something that's really unique to us. So a student can actually study two different bachelor degrees and they average only adding on one year to a typical bachelor degree. So some of the programs are only four years and you get two different bachelor degrees by the time you graduate, which is really awesome for students with multiple interests. And again, a great way um, to set yourself apart with your resume as well, of course. The academic requirements. Um, so there are different, as I said, entry requirements, but if you don't meet the entry requirements into one university, I would always suggest that you look at another one because we all have our own unique entry requirements. And more than likely, there will be a university that you might meet the requirements for. Location, of course, think about where you might want to study. And I always suggest to students that you have a little bit of a dreamer mentality when you're looking at it at first, because I think there's no point in just outing, let's say, Australia, for example, which is somewhere I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to get to go there again. So let me go there just for a semester. And once you actually dive into it, like, like me now, you realize like, if you hadn't decided to go overseas for your study, you would have just taken a completely different life path. So it might sound crazy to your family or to your friends. And for a lot of students, it does. I talk to a lot of students who say, you know, my parents just thought that was, it's way too far away. Like they can't even conceptualize me living over there. But it is, we're lucky in a world of technology and great travel um, on a normal year, of course, that we have access to each other no matter what. Um, so I would really consider just, you know, kind of opening up and really thinking about where you might dream to study and then having a look and seeing if it really is feasible. My dog just started squeaking his toy. So please excuse him if you hear that. He always, he was just sleeping, but he chooses exactly when he knows I'm, I'm talking and he does that. The other things to consider, of course, are costs, how much it costs and what grants and scholarships might be available. Are they FAFSA approved? So here at Monash, we do have FAFSA. So you can use your FAFSA funding for us. Accommodation, it's usually not mandatory to live in housing. 
um, at Australian universities, so consider that. And then you can see at the bottom, I've already talked about a lot of this, so I won't bore you too much with it, but things like what are the learning and teaching styles of the university? How long is the degree? Do you offer internships? Um, what do current students say? I always suggest to students that you actually talk to a student at the university to really get their insight into what it's like to study there. So those are just a bunch of factors to consider um, as an international student. Now, I'm just showing you here, I mentioned accommodation before, but I wanted to really highlight a major difference that I find between American and Australian universities is that we never ask for you to share a room. Um, and I don't believe any university does, but I, I could be wrong in saying that. But I know for the universities I've worked for, you always have a private bedroom, which I think is really nice. And I couldn't think of anything worse than trying to share a room with a stranger. So for me, like that suited me perfectly. When I moved here, I lived in accommodation. I had my own room in my own space, which I think is really great. So you can just see on the screen. So this one's one of us, our studio apartments that we have on campus. So it's a little bit different where we actually have their own private kitchen and bathroom as well. And like I said before, it's never compulsory or mandatory for you to stay on campus. So you do have the option to live on or off campus regardless of what year you're studying. Now, what might the schedule look like as an Australian student? So for me, when I was at an American university, it was usually two or three days a week for each class and an hour long or two hours long each time we're a bit different. So we like to chunk things and kind of time block. So you're usually in one class only once a week. So you might have what we call a lecture, which is where a larger group gets together and you're taught by, you know, it's a typical lecture room or lecture hall, or it might be a smaller group as well. But this is where you're doing more of that being talked at, if you will, which doesn't sound so nice, it's, but it's not quite the interactive um, part of the course. Now, a lot of our lecturers do actually offer the lecture portion as an online portion, but then you always come to what we call a tutorial tutorial or a lab. Now, this is a smaller group, and this is the more interactive session. So we love this style in that it's kind of like you're getting the information you need before you actually put it to practice, and that averages about 12 hours per week. And then, of course, you have the independent study, which is up to 28 hours per week, and that's for all of your classes that you might take in a semester. So for us here, a full semester is three classes, which should be very similar to at home, but a lot of students do take four classes as well. Now, if you're a medicine, nursing, or health science student, this might be a little bit different just depending on your labs and stuff, but of course, we can ask Kate about that as um, she is studying in that faculty as well. And we do a lot of flipped classroom as well. So a lot of you probably have heard of that, which is where we're giving you the content before class. And then once you're coming into class, we're just discussing the content and putting it to practice. Now, a little bit more about Monash specifically, just so that you have an idea of who we are, where we come from. So we're a quite new university established in 1958. We started with under 350 students, and now we're Australia's largest university, which is something we're really proud of. So we actually have about 33% international students with us. We have over 55,000 undergraduates now and over 24,000 graduate students. Um, and we have four major campuses here in beautiful Melbourne. So we're more in the suburbs. So that is something to really be aware of is that um, please don't expect for us to be based right in the city. We're in the suburbs, but I really like that for the students who are looking to have more of an on-campus experience. There's a really great campus community because if you're not in the city, it means a lot of students come for the day, they hang out for the day, they have lunch, they do their studying on campus, and then they go home afterwards. Whereas if you're based in the city, a lot of times I find that students um, are kind of catching the train for class and then leaving right away on the train again. So it is a really nice campus community. As I mentioned before, we're in that GO8 top eight group, and we have over 115 teaching partners in 30 countries. So what does that mean? It means that you can do one of those study abroad or exchange experiences as an international student with another university. So that's something that would be really cool is that you're an American student, but then you went and studied internationally for your whole degree, and you were also a study abroad student in another country as well. Like I couldn't think of anything better as most companies start to internationalize a little bit more. And even some of our medicine, nursing, and health science programs have internships 
for some experience workplace learning um, in different countries as well, which is really unique. Now I keep mentioning this word faculties. I think that's something that's a little bit different over here is that we call our program areas faculties. So each faculty has its own set of programs. So you can see all 10 of our faculties are here on the screen. And like I said, we have the largest range of program options. And a lot of our double degrees cross over into another faculty. So for business and education, for example, or probably business and arts would be more, more common. We have engineering and IT, for example. So a lot of them cross over into other faculties. So again, you would be looking at the degree requirements for the specific degree that you're wanting to study. Okay. Now that's enough out of my mouth. Um, so there are my contact details on the screen, but of course NSHS has, has them as well. Um, but if you did want to just like take a quick picture of that and you can also scan um, the QR scanner, let's say you might not be from the US or you might not live in the US. I think everyone should be here today, but you can also scan the QR code there. Um, and that will bring you to our page of contact details for the Monash International team. I know that there are quite a few questions that have come in. Um, and if you do have questions for Kate as well, please pop them into the Q&A rather than the chat. But now I think would be a great time to start a little conversation with Kate. Kate, you're still there. Hello, Kate. Okay, Kate, so you said that you are a Bachelor of Nursing and Midwifery student. So can you kind of tell everyone about your process of like, choosing like why you thought of Australia, why you thought of Monash and your program option as well? Uh, for sure. So um, yeah, so obviously nursing is something that the US does quite well. Um, so the reason I was really looking at studying abroad was sort of like what Emily was saying, um, just like the opportunities are so different when you're studying abroad and sort of like doing my degree here um, also lets me see what a different healthcare system is like, um, which has been really interesting um, to sort of get that like extra bit of like, oh, this is what, you know, public health care looks like and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that was part of it. And then also midwifery was a really huge component of that because that's something that does look a little bit different in the US. So the fact that um, Australia has such good opportunities for doing midwifery too, that was definitely part of it. Um, but I think also Emily was talking earlier about having placement. So we do a lot of placement in the hospitals. So I think it's about 800 hours of placement for nursing and 800 hours of placement for midwifery. So by the time you finish your degree or by the time I finish my degree, um, that's a lot of clinical experience already going into the workforce. Um, so I think that's a really huge um, sort of bonus. You feel really competent in your care and um, yeah, just really prepared, I think. I think that's a huge win. Yeah, for sure. And did you find, like, as far as the entry requirements for you, can you talk about the, so did you look at American universities to study with? Like, did you look through their entry requirements and stuff? And how did that compare to Monash's entry requirements over here? Yeah, um, I felt like actually Monash entry requirements were a little bit more straightforward. So when I was looking at studying in the US, I was only looking at North Carol uh, schools in North Carolina because that's where I'm from. Um, so like in-state tuition, all of that, only looking at North Carolina um, universities because I was like, if I'm going to study out of state and paying those prices, I want to go overseas. So the comparison is just with North Carolina. And I found that because I didn't have to do those prereqs was it courses I could just go straight to court like my classes relevant to my degree I found that Monash's like the intro requirements were actually a little bit um I guess more specialized but in the sense that it wasn't like I had to have all these like math components from the past like four years in high school because that wasn't relevant to what I was going to be doing um and then it was just my SAT score so that it actually felt pretty easy like it felt straightforward it didn't feel like oh my gosh I have to learn a whole new system it was like oh wait this makes sense and Monash does a really good job and I assume most universities but like putting that entry requirements like really clearly what they actually need so it's like an SAT score of this at least in order to apply and things like that so I think I'm really happy to hear that because I hear from a lot of students that they're like oh I don't know like what what I need it doesn't make sense so that's great and 
I will say though, once once we lay it out or explain it to students and counselors, a lot of times they're like, that's all you need. Like you don't need to, we don't take into consideration things like extracurriculars. We don't take into consideration, like you said, a lot of your earlier classes. Like it's just like in your final year or your final two years, you need this, this math, this English, this science and an SAT or an ACT. And that's usually it. Yeah. And no, like, college essay either. That's crazy. Oh, that blows no my mind. Essay, no references. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're academically in, you're in. And some, I will say some people feel like that's a little bit, I've actually had people say that might be a little bit unfair. But for us, because we're such an international university, it is actually the most fair way for us to do it. Because we don't want to disadvantage any student in, a, in another country, for example, who might not have had the same opportunities as someone in the U.S., for example, so it's like we don't want to we don't want to compare, you know. We want to give everyone the most fair chance of of getting in, and and the stats show for us that that's working really well. Um, on entry requirements, we just had a couple questions that I'll answer while we're talking anyway. Um, so someone asked if the AP classes reduce the three years of study. They don't because we don't have general. So usually when you have an AP class credit into your university studies, it's because it's covering one of your generals, um, but we do not do that here. So we already only offer a three-year program, which is um, as short as we can make it really. Um, maybe you could talk about this actually, Kate, as far as, so you kind of mentioned the financial side of things. So someone just asked like, do you have any tips on paying for university here or like when you were going to study here how did you conceptualize like how am I going to pay for that yeah that's a really fair question and I think that that was something and probably something everyone thinks about when they're thinking about universities like gosh how am I going to cover this um yeah. so I think that that was part of what I was looking at was that cost like okay does it actually make financial sense to go overseas or is that just going to be like a huge extra burden um but i think it, like you mentioned earlier with fast fafsa i always say it wrong fafsa i know um, it's a hard <laughs> fafsa yeah FAFSA, okay um with sort of the the government student aid like you can apply for that here and still get it with some of your courses too so i think that that's still like a huge um component you can get a lot of that there and i've also applied for um like like extra scholarships if that makes sense so like not scholarships just from FAFSA or like just from Monash Monash has a few scholarships too um but I've applied for like additional ones and that's helped and then I think the working part-time so everyone here has like when you're doing uni everyone has a part-time job like I would say it's very rare if someone isn't working part time while you're here. So yeah. there's definitely that like culture ingrained in the uni where you're also like working while you're doing school and all of your lecturers and everyone are aware that everyone's working too. Um, so I think that adds a nice like sort of the day to day living part side of things too. you get to sort of make that money as you go. Yeah. And on that, what do you have to say about the work life balance? So like you feel like you just said they kind of assume that you're probably working outside of uni. So like and I guess because you weren't a um, university student in the US, um, maybe it's you have a different perspective on it. But like I found when I was a student over there, it was just so intense, like having classes several times a week. And I felt like the content was very intense too. And there was a lot of time like that you needed to dedicate to your own studying. But what do you like, in your opinion, what is that like for you? Yeah, um, that's a good question because I think what my first year I planned my classes because you have different class times you can allocate into. I planned my classes over five days but I had like a class a day and it was like two hours and then I'd be done for the day. And I was just on campus every day. But what my friends all do and what I later started doing is you condense your classes into like two, one or two days, depending on the course you're in, depends on how many on-campus classes you have to be at. Um, and then you sort of go in for that like intensive day and the other days you do that independent study, you do that, you know, working on your assignments and then you have time to like fit that around your work schedule. And I think that because like everyone does have that part-time job, it's just like created a way that you can also work while studying instead of yeah. like studying is the only thing you do. 
Yeah, definitely. And someone's just asked, um, they're also in health sciences. Can you talk about how different the healthcare system is in the US versus Australia or vice versa? Um, I can try and speak to that. I think my understanding of the US like healthcare system is a little bit um, probably novice just because I haven't actually studied it too much. Um, but here in Australia, we have universal health care, which means that every citizen gets health care for free paid by the taxes, like by taxes. So when they come into hospital, they get that all taken care of um, for free. So it's actually a really different system. And it relies a lot more on primary health, because people are seeing their GPs and seeing primary care nurses and things like that, more than they would be going to hospital. So ideally, hospitals sort of like the, the last resort, they've gone through all these steps. Now they're unwell, and they need that critical care in hospital. Um, so I think that that's a little bit different in that there's not like, getting health care doesn't feel like a big deal. Like everyone goes for their yearly checkups and things like that. Like it, there's not this sort of lack of, I don't know. I, I think people feel really supported with the healthcare system. So I think yes. in terms of studying it, it's really interesting um, because I, yeah, um, not to be too political, but I think that that's sort of like what ideally in the future people are going to be able to have access to health um, and so having that readily available, I think, is a really interesting thing to learn about. And I like, from my perspective, not being in the medical field at all, <laughs> but I just realized like, like I had to get a, like a minor surgery once. And I just remember the doctor, the surgeon saying, you'll be so surprised by how much cheaper it is to get the surgery here than it would be in the US. Like it was a, like a fraction of what I would have paid at home. Like I, and I, I think my headspace was a little bit like, how much is this going to cost me? Like I was a student, you know, I'm like, oh God, like how many thousands is this going to be? And it wasn't even close to that. So that's a huge, especially for anyone who's not in the medical system and who might not quite understand like the complexities like Kate or a student who's in the medical field would. Um, that's just one factor. And the fact that when you have a student visa, you have that insurance. So you are well taken care of. Like it is kind of, yeah, culturally and through the government, it's kind of a huge, it's a huge thing that we do take good care of people. Um, so that's really something that's nice. And it's nice for parents to know that too, I think, because of course, that's always a worry. You know, what if something happened, you're so far away. Yeah. Um, it's important to know that you can get that care and it's a very good medical system. Um, because even for my parents sometimes they say something like well do they do they do that in Australia or do they, like you know and it's like we're we're very we're very progressive here yes we've got this down so yeah so yes yeah. yeah a couple things on that I just had a couple questions from students that I might answer quickly here um so someone asked when I studied abroad did I find a school in the country that I wanted to go to, or did I go through an American um, school to study abroad? So when you're looking to study abroad, my perspective was actually, I just, I mean, I did this in a way I would not suggest doing it. I was walking to class one day and I saw this cool sign that said study in Australia. And I was like, oh, that sounds fun. And I attended this session and um, this lady from the university I went to Australian lady was just talking about the experience and then a student actually um, was there as well who he had been a study abroad student and he talked about his experience and I was absolutely sold on it so I kind of went the way where I was like yeah studying abroad would be cool I kind of didn't for some reason I just didn't want to go to Europe I just felt like most students had kind of been there I wanted to do something that I felt again I felt like I'll never go to Australia again let me just go like while I'm in uni while I can get class credit it's a good excuse. And then usually if you are a student, your university will have partner universities in another country. So that's usually where they'll guide you to first. But please keep in mind that like, let's say you're at an American university and you wanna study with us at Monash, which we would absolutely love. And let's say that they're not a partner uh, um, with us. You can still do a study abroad with us. It just might mean more work on your end to make sure that your classes are all credited back to your home university. So this is where we, re we rely on your advisors and counselors to make sure that they're supporting you there. And I will say sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge because a lot of times they want you to just 
stick with who they know and they want you to stick with their partner universities, but you do have the opportunity. Um, and I always remind students, it's, it's your money you're putting towards your tuition and it really is what's gonna go on your resume and be part of your experience. So if there is a university you're highly interested in, push for that and try to contact someone at that university too to get help there. Someone's asked um, to clarify when you apply to Monash, do you get accepted? Are you only accepted to the school of your major? Um, are you accepted, you are only accepted to this. Yeah, so you actually, when you apply for Monash, you're applying for a program. You're not just applying for the university overall, you're applying, so like for Kate, for example, she applied for the Bachelor of Nursing and Bachelor of Midwifery, and that's the program she got into. Um, a study abroad and exchange opportunity, that's different. So if you're already an American university student and you wanna study abroad or exchange, they can usually tell you if you're eligible or not, okay? Um, and I think too, for when you apply to like the specific faculty, you can still get transfers to other faculties. So if you start it and you're like, oh, that's actually not what I wanna do. I think I wanna do this. You can still transfer, like there's not like a huge hassle of apply, like this extra application process. Like it's easy to transfer and lots of people do it too. Yeah, lots of people do it. So sometimes with that, just the only thing is that the classes might not all transfer over. But for the most part, if you do want to transfer, you can do that. Like it's obviously, but it's not ideal. But most students end up like changing their mind or they might have a little change of heart and need to transfer over. So that is something to keep in mind, too, definitely. Um, people are asking about COVID requirements, like with the testing and stuff. So we do have somewhat flexible requirements right now, just if you couldn't take the SAT or ACT or if it's delayed. So we do offers based on what we call predicted grades. This is kind of a foreign concept, I think, for a lot of American students. You can actually apply for Monash with incomplete transcripts and an incomplete high school diploma. And what you do is you have your counselor or whoever's looking after you, whoever usually issues kind of the more official documents on your behalf, you have them um, put together what they would call predicted grades. So what they assume you're going to get um, when you do finish your high school studies. And you can actually get what we call a conditional offer based on that. A conditional offer is something that you have to, you still have to show us that you've met the requirements at the end, but you can still get an offer for that. Now the essay, someone's asking more specifically about, and Kate, maybe you remember, did you take the SAT? Do you remember what your SAT requirement was for your program? I'm looking it up now, but. I'm not entirely, but it's also changed from when yeah. I took the SAT because the point system's different now. So I'm just looking up right now my little cheat sheet. So, um, and yes, you can access the cheat sheet. If you want to send me an email, that would be great. And I can send that over to you. Um, so for example, our Bachelor of Biomedical Science, it requires a 1290 in the SAT. Health Science requires 1120. Um, nursing, requires 1160. Um, right now, the Bachelor of Midwifery and Nursing or Bachelor of Nursing and Bachelor of Midwifery requires 1240. So those are just some examples of the, the minimum SAT requirement, but then you also need to meet, you have to have um, a 12th grade English and you have to have a certain um, math class as well. So it looks like um, our math is a little bit higher for this one. So that's just something to be aware of, but that's more particular stuff or more um, in depth. So I can always send that to you too, if there's a specific program that you're looking at. So really what you should do is look at which program you wanna study and figure that out first, or which one sounds interesting. Then you get into the entry requirements um, for that specific program. Yes, Australian universities definitely have clubs and sports associated with the university, um, even if you don't live on campus. So it's a little bit different how we work, where even like, for example, I play volleyball at Mon for Monash University for their club, but that's not actually associated with the university, which might sound weird, but it's actually like a city club, but we represent Monash. Um, I don't know, Kate, are you part of any clubs and societies outside of, outside of everything else that you're doing? Um, yes, so I'm part of the nursing, the Monash University Nursing Club, um, but then I think there's also the, the colleges, so when you live on res, you're in a college, but when, even if you don't, so on res is like living in the 
dorms sort of thing. Even if you're not living on res, there's also the non-residential colleges, which are sort of like that same sort of atmosphere where you're like grouped with a group of people and you get to do lots of activities, but it's sort of, you don't have to live on campus to be able to do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, Monash has a lot of clubs. So lots of different things you can be like, get, get into. Um, so yeah, th I think that's really good. But in terms of like um, sports, I don't, I don't really, <laughs> I'm not a part of a sports team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we do have a lot. So we have over 100, 100 clubs and societies to choose from, and there's like a huge range of sports. And I would say we have a really, uh, compared to some Australian universities, we do have a really wide range of sports, including a lot of the American sports that you might be used to. But then we also have Australian ones as well. So we have a really beautiful sports facility at our Clayton campus um, that has an awesome gym, a really big, cool pool. And it's actually like, our university gym and fields are something that the whole community uses. So it's not just something only for the university, which I actually really like. I think it makes you feel part of a bigger group um, and part of the community really. So yeah, there are basically clubs and societies for everyone. If there's not the club that you're looking for, you can start one too. So that's always an option. Um, deadlines to apply. So there aren't specific deadlines for most programs. Again, MNHS, the Medical Nursing Health Science, that'll be a little bit different. There will be harder requirements um, as far as when you need to apply by for certain programs. But in general, I tell students apply at least three months before the start date of your program. Now that's something that I didn't cover, but I should, is that a huge difference is that we start our programs in February, that's semester one, and July, which is semester two. Every time I say that, students are like, well, if I graduate in May, when, I, when am I supposed to come? Is it gonna be weird to come in July? Like everyone else is starting in February or is that too, too close? Like if I only graduate in May, how am I gonna make it there for July? You can do either one. So it just depends if your program that you're wanting to study, if it does start in both semesters. So some of our programs only start in semester one, which is February, but a lot of them start in both February and July. No, it won't be weird to start in July because if there's an intake, that means a lot of students are starting in July. So you don't have to feel like, there's, <laughs> I guess here in, in Australia, there's not this huge, there's not this huge push like you, you might see, you know, in the fall semester at home, everyone's moving in, there's a move-in day, there's a move-in week, there's huge parties. I'm not saying there aren't huge parties in a huge move-in week um, here, but it happens in July too. So it's like, it's two different lots. And like, there's just more celebrations. This is how the Australian culture is. It's like, oh, we'll, we'll do that in July and we'll also do that in, in February, right? Um, you started your program in February, did you, Kate? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, so I think that that actually, and that was part of it too. I think I got to like the end of my school and I was like, this is very stressful to do college applications at the same time. So it was nice that I knew I wanted to apply to that one in February because I had, I started my application then in the I think I've cut out. Oh, I don't know. But oh, I started sure. that application. Okay, my internet was unstable. It was telling me. But um, no I started one, that no application in the, <laughs> um, in the fall. So that was nice because it gave me sort of a bit more breathing room between finishing high school and starting university. And that's a really good point. I always tell students like that. I know that culturally we kind of push in the US, I feel like, like, where are you going? When are you going? When are you leaving? What are you doing in the meantime? And it's like, you can wait till February. It's only, and remember the program is usually shorter here. So it's like, even if it's, you're starting in February, it's a three year program on average, or if you're doing, you know, a more hard, hard skill or an honors degree is what we would call it. But um, Honestly, a lot of students will work in that time. They might come here a little bit early to kind of check out what we have to offer and do a little bit of travel before they start their program. So there's not a huge, but you can potentially, if you wanted to, we do have students who graduate in May and they start their program in July. So that's always an option. That's there. Um, someone has asked um, for advice on visas. So the, probably the reason you didn't this person has said they did a lot of research on student visas. Um, it's actually quite straightforward to get a student visa. So it's what we call subclass 500. Now, Australian universities aren't actually qualified slash registered to give visa advice. So that's something to be aware of that some, sometimes the university will say, you have to talk to the Department of Home Affairs, which is the official advice, but it's a subclass 500 visa to get 
to get a visa, you first need what we call a COE, which is a confirmation of enrollment. So you basically have to, you have to get everything okayed by the university and the university has to send you a COE. That's a document that you use to apply for a university. So it's a subclass 500. You need to um, yeah, have that document. You need to have student health cover. Um, but if you look up 500 on the Department of Home Affairs website, there'll be more information around that. Um, a couple questions. Oh, okay. Um, do you need an ACT score or just an SAT score or both? You can apply with either one. You only need one. Um, and you can also apply, let's say you've taken two AP courses. This is a kind of a cool way to get entry too. So if you've taken AP Chem and AP English, for example, all of our programs will have a minimum requirement for a combined score of AP classes, if that makes sense. So if you take a test, you get two threes on your AP. So you pass both, both of them. That means you have a combined score of six. So you could actually use that score for your for some programs to gain entry. So that would mean you don't have to take an SAT or an ACT, you could use your two AP exams. More commonly though, students will have an ACT or an SAT and you only need one. Um, would the spring term equivalent be February to May or June? So we have, um, we have winter and summer. <laughs> so we're different there again. So we're not fall and spring, we're winter and summer. So February is uh, summer. Um, winter will be the July semester. Kate, two questions for you. Number one, what do you do on the weekend here? Number two, what do you do during breaks? And what, and what do breaks look like? Like how many breaks do you get and what do you do? Good questions. Um, I, I, I wonder if this would be similar for you, Emily, but I think that Australia is like the place for brunch. Like Melbourne's just, you know, Br you, you brunch on the weekend. So usually my weekend plans start with a bit of brunch on Saturday. There's lots of really cool ca cafes around. Um, and I think what you were saying about like being in uh, our campuses being based in the suburbs, like the public transport system in Melbourne is actually really incredible. So there's lots of like really easy access to the city too. So um, if, you know, if I'm having a bit of a fancy weekend, I might, you know, just hang out in the city with some friends. Um, but I don't know, I think the the weekends are definitely time, like, especially if I'm on placement, they're like time that I'm catching up on all the things I need to catch up on meeting with friends who I didn't get to see during the week and things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, what about you? What do you get up to? I am with you on brunch. I've been absolutely obsessed with going. I mean, even if it's just coffee, I probably go most days. Like, and because I'm working from home a lot of days right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so, but it's so good. And like, there's okay. so many cool places that you don't even know. Honestly, sometimes you don't know that there's even a cafe there and you walk in and it's like this beautiful hidden cafe. Um, and I, I'm actually vegan. So I find that it's really easy to be vegan here, which I love. And we're just known for a lot of different, like I was in an Uber last night. I went to, um, yeah, a restaurant last night, a really cool one called Chin Chin. And I was in the Uber. Yes. So good. <laughs> guy, it's so good. And the guy said, there's been research, like there's been an article done on Melbourne restaurants and cafes. And he said, if you wanted to go to a new one, you could go 365 days of the year to a new one every single day. That's so that's crazy. something, yeah, that's really cool. Otherwise on the weekend, I will say I love to be outside and I go to, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a velodrome. I feel like I didn't hear that word until I moved here, but it's a, like, it's a bike. It's where you just go around, like, because I love biking. And for like a workout, I'll go, I'll go biking or I'll go to a park. Um, I live right along a really beautiful path. So we do that a lot. Um, I also, yeah, I play volleyball. So I go play volleyball. But like Kate said, it's a great like time to catch up on what you need to. Every Saturday morning, which I would highly suggest to anyone who comes over here, if you have family at home who are like, I'm never going to hear from you. Do what I do every Saturday morning. I give my mom a call. So it's a Friday night phone call. It's my Saturday morning call. Um, and it's a really nice way to stay connected. I don't know, Kate, do you like talk to your family a lot at home? Do you have scheduled calls with them? 
Yes. So during COVID, well, before COVID, I was like calling them every few days. So maybe like three days, I sort of be like, oh, I haven't talked to them in a while. I'll give them a call. Um, then during COVID, when things were chill, we had like lockdown. I was calling them every night. So now it's sort of in that transition back out because we're not in lockdown anymore. It's yeah. life feels pretty normal. So just like, yeah, calling them every so often. So yeah, I, I would say I, I talk to them quite often. They probably want me to talk to them a little bit less, honestly. They're probably like, please <laughs> stop calling me. That's so um, funny. Do you yeah. feel like they like were worried at all? Like when you came to study over because they're at home, right? They're in the US. They actually live overseas. So I think they weren't worried, but I think the rest of my family were worried. Like my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, they were worried. They were like, what are you going to do? Because their idea is that you're going to live by family and be supported. But I think the reality of university is now is that most people move away for university anyway. So you're not actually like you're really building that community with people at university. Um, yeah. So I think that even though, you know, it might be scary for them, you're getting that same sort of support that you would get usually with the people that you're around anyway. And because it's such an international school too, um, there's lots of people here who are looking for that same sort of support that they're wanting like a community that is there for them in the highs and the lows. Um, that's so true. It's like your chosen family over here, right? Like that's what I was explaining to my, to my mom last week. I was like, it's like I've chosen another family. Like I'm so close to the people here now, which is a really unique, cool connection, I think. Yeah. As well. Um, I think in terms of breaks, just to answer that one quickly, we have a mid-sim break, so one in the semester um, yeah. for both semesters, and then um, you'll have that winter break. That's usually just a month. That's that June, July, because Southern Hemisphere, so we're opposite, um, so that you'll have like about a month there, and then the summer one's the long one, and that's usually when I'll do most of my traveling to see my family. And have you traveled much around... Um around the country like within Australia um a little bit but not as much as I'd like to um I want to get to the barrier reef very quickly so um that's my goal that's my next goal one day <laughs> um but yeah Australia is absolutely gorgeous and it's really easy to get around too by car so if you guys drive learning the opposite side of the road is a little bit challenging but it is it very convenient for getting around <laughs> It, it was more the roundabouts for me I, because when you go around a roundabout you don't think about it but you have to look the other way yeah <laughs> my first time I was like oh I'm looking right but at home I'm used to looking right so yeah but you get used to it don't you mm, yeah no it's good well it looks like we're like just running on time um for the whole hour which I'm really surprised by but thanks so much Kate like you it's so helpful to hear from thank you, you. Think... thank you for having me of course what an awesome hour that was guys thank you so much for giving us an, a glimpse into the world of Australia I know that um I can't wait to visit Australia one day myself and it sounds like it's a really exciting place after listening to the webinar tonight so um, I hope that you see some of our members coming into Monash University in yeah. the next term. So, yeah, we will send as many people your way as we can. <laughs> um, we hope that we've changed some minds tonight about studying in Australia versus the U.S. So thank you so much, everyone who stayed on with us tonight, who attended. Thank you, Emily and Kate, for being here so early um, in your part of the world. Um, and thank you, of course, to Monash, which is an awesome partner of NSHSS. Um, thank you to my team and to everyone for putting on an awesome third session in the College and Career Series. Um, be sure to join us for the uh, remaining two sessions this week. Tomorrow we have Scholarship Matching, Find Scholarships Just for You, presented by FastWeb. And then Friday we conclude our week with Scholarships with the Army ROTC, Learn, Lead, Succeed, presented by the U.S. Army. ROTC. So um, I will show you how you can register for those remaining events. If you scan the top QR code on your screen here, you can register for the final two events in the series this week. And then of course, all of us here at NSHSS are greatly looking forward to seeing our members and families in person again in Washington, DC this August 6th and 7th at our Scholars Day event. Um, same concept here, you can scan the QR code with your phone and it will pull up a link to register for Scholars Day. 
Um, we are looking forward to seeing you guys at the, that event, which is going to feature a college and career fair with our university, corporate, and government partners. We'll also have some educational workshops and also our keynote speaker. You might know him from TikTok, possibly. His name is Kyle Sheely. He's coming to be our keynote speaker at Scholars Day, so you don't want to miss him. So we will see you there at Scholars Day this August. Um, thanks again, Kate and Emily. We had an awesome evening with you guys, morning for you. <laughs> and um, we will say good night. And that is all for tonight's college and career session. We will see you all tomorrow. Thanks so much, Grace. Thanks, Kate. See you thanks. guys. Thank you.